Media Matters talk. Um, in our first Media Matters talk, for those of you who are here, we looked at legacy at, at the magazine industry, particularly specialising both online and print. Today, we're very privileged to have Therese Malone, who is from one of uh, a name that will be familiar to you all, The Guardian, both newspaper, news site. Um, Theresa is visuals editor, also looks after the social media, um, and has a long and distinguished career. Just to give you some idea of the Guardian reach, today five million people will be looking at the Guardian's digital offering, not just here, but all around the world. The Guardian itself has a long and illustrious reputation. My students know we've been looking at, in particular, at the work of the Guardian's media gentlemen on the Windrush scandal. But there are many, many other uh, exciting stories going from environmental, um, going through to phone hacking that Guardian journalists have uncovered. Coupled with brilliant feature and visual co coverage, which really is at the cutting edge. When you think about digital, you think about Guardian as being at the cutting edge, whether that's been experimenting with virtual reality or whether that is looking at different ways. Comment is free, which Theresa joined in 2006 as a sub-editor, was the first really to give readers a voice. So Theresa joined in 2006 as a sub-editor, worked her way up. Some of the highlights of her career, as she's told me, have been looking at things as diverse as a pink public opinion on Obama in 2010, raging to new ways to cover the Glastonbury Festival. So we're very privileged to have her here today. Particularly for us as a media group, now we're in the top 20 in the UK, um, which is, is very good news for us, in the Guardian League table, it's no <laughs> And also because we're continually looking on ways to bring you um, the best, the latest uh, talk in the industry. Because although we as tutors do our best to keep up, I think it's always better to hear from people who are at the cutting edge. So thank you all for being here, and I'm now going to hand over to Theresa, once we can go big. Thanks, Sharon. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hear me at the back? Good. Uh, so I'm Theresa Malone. I'm the Head of Visuals and Social at The Guardian. Thanks for having me along. It's very nice to be here to talk to you today. Um, Sharon asked me to talk a bit about my career um, and, the, and the sorts of skills that the journalists in my teams have. So just in summary, I'll take you through kind of my own journalism timeline, what the visuals team at The Guardian does, what the social team does, and then we'll think a bit about who are the journalists of the future, the kind of skills they have and the challenges that they face. Um, and then I've got a few tips for getting the job that you want in journalism or in other areas, if that's, uh, if that's more your thing. Who here does want to be a journalist? Good range, good range um, of those who wants to be a news reporter? Who likes the news? A few news reporters there. Any sport fans? Anyone want to be a sports reporter? Couple there. Um, feature writers? Anyone into writing? Wants to write magazine features? Always a popular one. Um, any aspiring editors? Yeah, <laughs> one or two. Uh, who's more into video journalism? Any photographers? Audio journalists? Anything else? No, a good range of aspirations there. Interesting mix. Um, so why did I end up working in journalism? Well, this is a fairly recent front page from the local newspaper from my hometown, the Loughborough Echo. Um, and when I was uh, at school, I'd always enjoyed writing and storytelling. 
I thought a career in journalism sounded quite exciting. Uh, but I do remember that our school careers advisor was uh, rather negative about the idea, to say the least. I remember having a chat with her. She was actually a PE teacher. Um, but I remember having her chat with her and she's, she sort of dismissed it with her. Journalism is very competitive, don't bother. If you like words, go and work in a library instead. Um, so I ignored that advice. Um, and I managed to get a couple of days work experience at the Loughborough Echo. Um, and I just loved the atmosphere of the newsroom. I loved going out with reporters um, and the whole process of putting a newspaper together. So I went to university in Liverpool. I studied uh, English and communication studies. And then it was time to start looking for a job. Um, I'd worked part time through university to kind of um, pay my way through. So I hadn't had that much time to do any vocational work experience at that time. Um, so after university, I moved back home and did some voluntary work at a community arts charity and worked part-time as a photographer's assistant. As part of the voluntary work, I um, helped put together a local arts magazine um, over the course of a weekend. And that just sort of reignited my desire to work in journalism. So I decided it was time to bite the bullet and do a professional qualification. Um, so in 2003, armed with a qualification for the National Council um, for the Training of Journalists, I set about looking for my first job in journalism. Um, so where did I work in those early days? Well, nowhere glamorous, I can tell you. Uh, my first job was with a publication called Camcorder User Magazine, um, which, I mean, does anyone even still call them camcorders? I don't know. Um, I was a sub-editor there. It was very geeky. Not as geeky as Home Cinema Choice Magazine, uh, which was a magazine for people who like to spend all their money on expensive televisions and speaker systems. Um, I couldn't really understand it myself, but loads of people seem really into it, so there you go. Um, and even though these publications weren't really my thing, I did learn a lot um, about reporting and sub-editing while I worked there. Just don't ask me what a subwoofer is. Then I moved on to Amateur Photographer magazine, which um, was still pretty geeky, but uh, it was a bit more interesting to me because I liked photography and learning about cameras and how they worked. And I stayed there for a couple of years. So the office for amateur photographer was based in the South Bank. And every day I'd get the number 63 bus down Farringdon Road, past the Guardian offices and think, well, maybe one day I'll work there. Then finally, in 2006, after a series of nerve wracking tests and interviews, I got offered a job as a sub-editor on what was then called Common is Free, the Guardian's opinion website. So these were relatively early days in digital journalism, and it's fair to say that a lot of people didn't think there was a lot of future in it. Um, I would proudly tell people that I'd got a job on the Guardian website, and the response was almost always the same. Oh, well, never mind. If you stick with it, maybe they'll give you a job on the actual newspaper one day. But this first gig at The Guardian opened up a lot of opportunities for me. And 13 years later, I'm still there. So there have been lots of highlights. I was working in a small team of four, and that meant that everyone on the team had to learn how to do everything. I was surrounded by some really brilliant people, which could be intimidating at times, but as well as becoming a faster and better sub-editor, I learned to edit and commission for a digital publication. This opened up lots of opportunities, including a stint editing The Guardian's US opinion site in Washington, DC. When I came back from America, I worked on The Guardian's arts desk as a digital producer. And uh, during this time, I started working on a lot of redesign projects for this section of the website. And that meant collaborating with developers and designers and translating to them what we did as journalists in editorial. In 2014, the whole of The Guardian went through a redesign so that it would be responsive, so it would work just as well on mobile screens as on tablets as on desktops. And I worked as an editorial lead on that project. Then in 2017, I was asked to take on a new challenge of running The Guardian's visuals and social teams. Um, this was a huge leap for me. 
uh, I was suddenly managing a team of graphic artists, developers, designers, social producers, all skills that I had no practical background in myself. But I realised that the skills that I brought were as an experienced digital editor. So it's my job to help them make the right editorial choices and to remove any obstacles that are stopping them from producing groundbreaking work. So what does the Guardian's Visuals team do? This is some of us looking very festive, about to go for our Christmas meal last year. Uh, but apart from doing things like that, um, the, team, the team's work can be described as reporting the news visually. So newspaper journalism has traditionally been about text and to some extent photographs. What we do in the visuals team is to show people what's happening by reacting to breaking news each day with a wide range of charts, maps, tables, explainer graphics. We also uh, produce experimental interactive formats which try, try to break away from the idea that a news story has to be just a text article with a picture at the top. There are other ways of telling those stories. We quite often use data and visualise data as a way of doing that. I'll show you some examples. So, this is an explainer. Oh, I'll just get, get rid of this ask from The Guardian for me to give it some money. Okay. Not now. Thank you, Guardian. <laughs> so, um, we won quite a few awards for this piece, which is very simple. It uses data about Amazon to increase the size of the bubble on the screen, highlighting how quickly Amazon grew as a business and eclipsed all its competitors. So you can see, it takes up the whole screen by 2017. This next one was um, an exclusive story that our environment, one of our environment correspondents brought to us about how air pollution may be damaging every single organ in the body. What we attempted here was to visualise the invisible. So you can see that as you scroll, you can see the air pollution affecting different organs, along with the explanatory text on the left there. And then um, another new format that we did was before Boris Johnson became the leader of the Conservative Party earlier this year, um, The Guardian ran a series trying to reveal who is the real Boris Johnson. And as part of that, my team decided, well, there are so many contradictions about Boris Johnson. Is he... Um, you know, is he gaff prone or is he, uh, is it all part of his kind of political act? So let me just show you what we did. We produced this quiz and it allows people to kind of think, well, I think he is genuinely gaff prone or I think it's all part of an act. And then you can enter your response see how your view compares to what other readers think and have a little bit of analysis by our, um, one of our political correspondents which will uh, help you work out um, if what you think is true or not. So there are a few of the things um, that we've, we've worked on recently. Um, we also, a big part of our job in the visuals team is to explain the world to our readers. So, for example, last year we ran a piece with lots of animated graphs explaining the state of the US political landscape. Had this piece which was about, um, oh, let me go back into present mode. This piece was um, a scrolling timeline which took um, 24 hours of violence in Afghanistan. We collaborated with the Bureau of Investigative Journalism on this one and they had recorded all the violent incidents that took place um, over 24 hours in Afghanistan so that we could show how much um, fighting remains in what is largely a forgotten war now. 
Uh, and this Brexit negotiations piece was quite fun. I'll just show you this. Um, Brexit negotiations were pretty dry. I'm not sure if you noticed. Um, but what we thought we'd do is have some fun with it and create a series of, um, digest them as a series of IM messages between the leaders, complete with emojis. Um, and we found that this was something that we could keep updated as all the different talks went along and um, people kept coming back and finding it time after time and found it a useful way of keeping up to date with what was going on in the talks. Okay. So, uh, just, um, so all those projects that I've just talked about would have been several weeks in the making, but we also do a quicker turnaround format known as the visual guide, which we can produce in breaking news situations to give people a bit more context about what has happened in a particular story. So, um, for example, we uh, have done visual guides for Grandfather Tower. When Khashoggi um, was murdered, we tried to explain using um, satellite images what had happened there. And we often use maps um, and annotated images to describe what's happened with, um, in the case of natural disasters as well. My team also looks after live data, so where there's a dynamic data set that's going to be constantly updating, such as election results or live sports results. If you um, log onto the Guardian website to find out those results, um, it will be the visuals team that has created those pages. So 16 people in the team, two main work, work streams that I alluded to, that's sort of the daily graphics and the mid to longer term projects. We have many different skills in the team, uh, including graphics, information design, illustration programming, digital design, cartography, data journalism, statistics, editing, and audience expertise. Everything we do is optimized for mobile first. So increasingly people are, um, reading and consuming Guardian journalism on mobile screens. So if what we do doesn't work on mobile, then it just doesn't work full stop. We contribute graphics to the print edition. We're collaborative, so unlike many desks at the Guardian or any newspaper which has a specific subject area, we work across all the subjects. So we collaborate with journalists from across the organization. Um, and we are a very much an audience first team, but we've got some awards as well. Uh, what does the Guardian social team do? There's a little picture of us having a totally relaxed and not staged at all meeting. Um, we are a small, nimble and collaborative team and we're always ready to adapt to the next big change in social media. Um, does everyone here use social media? Does anyone not use social media? No renegades fighting the backlash. Okay. Um, do you use social media to get your news as a source of news? Yeah, lots of, little bit, lots of nodding heads. Okay. So um, some of the things that we do in the social team are that we tell our stories in new ways to off-platform audiences. We create original content for social channels. We build off-platform audiences and communities. We're a point of contact with social platforms, so there are people at Facebook and Instagram and Twitter who we talk to on a fairly regular basis. Um, we keep an audit of the Guardian's social accounts, so if they're inactive or not very impactful, we close them down. Uh, we provide lots of advice and training for journalists um, on tools and best practice, and also, you know, in more recent times, how to deal with abuse that they receive online. Uh, we make lots of decisions about whether an account should be manual or automated. Um, we monitor the impact of social posts, so we're constantly looking at data and seeing what works. And we work with a lot of other um, Guardian departments, such as marketing um, and comms. So um, our main focus is on Instagram in the social team. Um, although our main Facebook and Twitter uh, accounts are a mixture of manual and automated. Um, we uh, have, have been more recently building up an audience on Instagram and focusing there. Um, and I think some of the things that we've learned about Instagram are um, that there's great potential for reach there. 
So we have 2 million followers on The Guardian's main Instagram account, um, but Instagram has more than a billion monthly active users. Um, we've also found that it's helped us to tell our stories in a format that's increasingly familiar to digital audiences. So through using Instagram um, formats like stories, um, and gallery posts, and those kind of things, which I'll talk a bit more about later. Um, we're, we're sort of telling Guardian stories in new ways, and some news publishers are now taking those types of formats onto their own websites, rather than just doing them on social. Um, it's a new way for our audience to participate in our journalism. So um, people can comment or react to our posts on Instagram without visiting the Guardian website. And it's taught us how to break down complex issues for new audiences, and importantly, in a very visual way. Um, so again, breaking away from the idea of journalism just as text. And it's helped us build um, an engaged audience on topics that we know our audience cares about on Instagram. So this was one of our top performing posts from the last year. Um, it was... Um, a video of the US politician Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, giving a speech about the Green New Deal. And it was a very powerful speech. And I think people, part of the reason people reacted well to it is because it's an inspirational figure speaking about the environment, which is a really important topic for our audience on Instagram. Um, and making people feel like they have a voice and that they're being represented by these figures. We also find that people react very well to moments of solidarity. So this is a video of some students performing the haka um, for their classmates who were killed in the Christchurch attacks in New Zealand earlier this year. Women's rights, gender rights, human rights are all topics that resonate with our audience on Instagram. Um, this was about the abortion laws in the US uh, fun fact, this one was reposted by Rihanna, which is part of the reason why it probably did so well. Um, and also, we found that our audience um, on Instagram likes it when we give them tips and advice, um, helping people feel like they can change things in their lives. Um, this was a post about secondhand September, with some inspirational stories from readers about their favourite items of secondhand clothes. Uh, mental health and well-being. Um, our Instagram audience is younger than our on-site audience. And we know, as I'm sure that you do, that mental health is a really big issue for young people today. So we are always trying to find ways to help our audi audience navigate through this issue and to feel less alone. And international stories are also very popular um, on Instagram. Um, our Instagram audience is international and interested in what's happening in the world and maybe that comes from a feel, the feeling of global connectedness that you have when you're on social media. So we've created a few templates to help us tell our stories in an easily recognisable way on Instagram. If you are very active on social media you might have tried some of these um, or similar things out or this might give you a few ideas for ways to experiment with storytelling on social media. So over here we have something very simple called a headline graphic. We use software called Sketch to create something like this. It's a design software um, and it just has a very bold headline and the Guardian logo in the top right so that it's immediately recognisable as a Guardian post and it also tells you something without you having to first read the caption about what the story is. Um, over here we have um, a quote card, so this allows us to um, use an image of a very recognisable figure, in this case Prince Harry, and a meaningful quote from them, um, which you can find out more about if you uh, read the caption or go onto the website. We also use this uh, swiping gal gallery format increasingly as an explainer format. Um, th in this case we've used some graphics as well there, um, but we've found the, a kind of combination of um, visuals and swiping the swiping gallery uh, really is a format that can break down a complex issue and explain it to our audience. And then this is quite a new um, 
template that we've introduced, which is to highlight comments that our audience makes on Instagram. So that people feel like, you know, we're, we're hearing them. Um, I just wanted to mention, uh, while we're on the subject, an essay that um, was written by The Guardian's editor-in-chief, which some of you may have seen. Um, Catherine Viner wrote this, and it addresses some of these challenges that journal journalists now face, and I'd recommend that you all read it. It's called A Mission for Journalists in a Time of Crisis. Um, and in this essay, she says there are five principles that Guardian journalists should abide by. We will develop ideas that help improve the world, not just critique it. We will collaborate with readers and others to have greater impact. We will diversify to have richer reporting from a representative newsroom. Journalism's had a problem with representation for some time. We will be meaningful in all of our work and we will report fairly on people as well as power and find things out. Okay. So in terms of the skills of the future, I think that the good news is there are more paths into the newsroom than ever before. Um, the traditional skills that you're all learning are still really valuable, but a lot of the people that I work with in my teams have entered, some of them without any formal journalism training, but with a background in some of these areas, community, audience, data analysis, video production, audio production, graphics, programming, digital design, social media, photography, and even email newsletters. And I just wanted to end on um, a few tips, because I see a lot of job applications, and there are some things that I find quite frustrating when I see that there are good candidates who just miss a trick in their applications. So I just want to flag some of these to you so that you don't make the same mistakes. Um, so the first one that drives me a bit mad is generic application. So, dear sir or madam, I wish to apply for the advertised position. I would love to work with your organisation. I am very hardworking and motivated. Well, you haven't told me what my organisation is. You haven't told me what the role that you're so interested in is. And um, I believe you that you're hardworking and motivated, but you need to make your application relevant. What I always look for is an absolute killer covering letter showing passion for the role and knowledge of the organisation. Another thing is that, and you might not believe me, but it's true, I often get applications for the wrong job at the wrong publication. So I've had applications for uh, the role of social media at The Guardian from people who want to be a reporter at The Telegraph, for example. Um, I can see how that is easily done when you're applying for a lot of jobs, but I think that you need to show that you're taking attention over your applications and don't copy and paste and double check accuracy before you send. Often applications are incomplete. If we ask for a CV and a covering letter, please don't not send a covering letter. Um, so read the guidelines and the questions carefully. And also I found that sometimes links don't work or are out of date. Um, when I read a job application, I read everything that's sent to me in it. Um, so assume that that will happen if you send in links. Finally, just wanted to end on um, a word of hope. So just don't give up. Perseverance and resilience is really key to getting the job that you want. Um, Secondly, apply for the jobs that you want, which might sound obvious, but I know that people are sometimes put off by not having one or two things in the job description. Um, don't be put off by that because enthusiasm can go a really long way. And a passionate covering letter can really make an impression. Even if you don't get the job this time, you'll be on someone's radar. So good luck and remember that journalism needs you all. Yes, um, my first boss at The Guardian was a woman called Georgina Henry, who I think Sharon knew, um, who was an incredible woman, um, a real kind of uh, 
force for getting things done, really passionate about social justice. And she was my first boss and she really kind of brought me up the ladder with her. Um, she sadly passed away a few years ago, but she was a real inspiration to me. And I don't think I would have had the same ambition of moving through the organisation if it hadn't been for her inspiration. Well, so for example, on Instagram, we always try to give the other perspective in the caption. Um, so I think caption writing is a real art on Instagram. And so if we're giving one side of the story and we know that there is another um, a comment to include from the other side, we will include it. Um, when we work on kind of bigger investigations, um, the investigations team always sends right to replies to the companies that we're writing about, um, which is a really important part of the process. So there are, there are things kind of baked into the process of taking a story from, um, from the first idea to its publication that seeks to um, have all those checks and balances. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions. Um, well, on the one hand, we're very lucky because we're an established news brand and we, um, there was a, a Reuters survey, I think done earlier, a Reuters Institute survey done earlier this year, which shows that The Guardian is the most trusted of UK news brands. So we're lucky in that sense, but I think at the same time, it doesn't take very much to lose that trust. So we have a responsibility to earn the trust that our readers place in us as well. Um, and we have to make sure that we get things right. And, the, and, and we don't always get things right. And when we don't, we have to be transparent about that. Um, I think when I started at The Guardian, it was quite intimidating because there were there were people there who were celebrities in their own right, you know, some of our most popular columnists, and you go along to morning conference and you're suddenly in a room with all these people who seem really clever and articulate, um, and uh, it can be quite intimidating to be in that environment. Um, so I think um, with sort of time and experience, you sort of come to break down some of those barriers and realise that actually, you're all sort of working towards the same cause and, um, and you stop feeling that kind of sense of intimidation. But uh, I'd say that was quite a big challenge. Um, the second question is, um, journalism has traditionally been uh, print and television media. When did you realize that digital media was the way to go where you hesitant to pursue it at first, or did it naturally feel like something that you needed to venture into? Um, I think that once I started working in digital media, it became clear that it was much more exciting and immediate <coughs> and the area that I wanted to work in. Um, was I hesitant? I mean, I think, uh, like I was saying, a lot of people were negative about it when I started working in digital media. Um, but I just found it really fun and exciting from the start and I couldn't really see myself going back to print journalism after that. Um, and thank you very much and thanks to our great guest speaker. Thank you, thanks for having me.